So by my clock, uh, it's 635. Um, is, is it okay if we get started? Would you like to wait a few moments? Okay. Okay, great. All right. Good evening, everyone. And thank you. I, I see some of you were at least sitting outside enjoying this beautiful day. So uh, I guess there are some benefits of Zoom, right? So um, I think with that, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, we have a presentation this evening. Um, what I would like to do is also introduce some of our team that you may or may not know. I'm Donna Daniska with Daniska Design. And I don't see, it's hard for me to see everyone. With me is Rick Rice with Danisco Design. Maybe you guys can just wave. Uh, Tim Cooper with Danisco Design. And then we have some consultants with us this evening. We have Janet Bernardo from Horsley Witten, who is our civil engineer and stormwater consultant. We have Mike Talbot from OTO, our geotechnical engineer. And then we also have special guests this evening, uh, Tim Thompson from PAR Engineering, our traffic consultants. And I thought I said David Loring and David Loring as well. So with that, um, that, that rounds out our team this evening. We may or may not all have speaking parts, but we're gonna try to get through the presentation quickly so that we can really have a dialogue. But we, what we wanted to do was share with you the updated information that we have this evening. So we just want to provide a little bit of community feedback and the criteria that's guiding the design, talk about the different site attributes and uh, talk through those a little bit more with you. And we want to thank everyone for their public comments and information as you know these sites intimately. Talk about the educational considerations that affect the design concepts and then a brief overview of the timeline. So, what we've learned through a, an enormous community engagement is that the new school truly needs to be an integrated student-centered school with outdoor connections, with a healthy environment that's sustainable as well as cost-effective. What we've learned through the community forums and visioning sessions is our takeaways are that it is a student-centered uh, learning experience, that it's collaborative, there's outdoor learning experiences, it supports special education, and that we want to take care of the uh, students from an environmental perspective. So you're going to see a lot of these um, themes kind of are recurring. Uh, we will talk about from an architectural perspective and goals again, an inclusive learning environment, ensuring the special education is integrated, that we have collaborative spaces, outdoor learning, cost effective. And then as we look at sustainability, make sure there's abundant of natural light, make sure the indoor environmental quality or air quality is um, obviously taken into consideration. And then of course, future thinking not only for the educational program that might shift over the last next 50 years, but also the what ifs of, and of COVID and everything else we could not plan for. Building and community goals, you know, we, we're organizing the building in a way that can be used as a community asset after hours. And, and most importantly, that it fits with the environment and the surroundings and that it, it truly is a community resource. And then just again, uh, talking about the site and sustainable goals, ensuring that we have ample outdoor learning, recreation for the community as it is a community asset, that we meet the net zero energy bylaw, that it's a healthy environment, and that whatever we do, we have to make sure that the training for staff is there to support your building. So we um, had a couple of, uh, community forums, and, and what we gained out of it is that flexible classrooms and spaces jump to the very top as far as exciting design patterns, classroom neighborhoods, and then um, as you can see, as it goes down all the way to extended learning spaces. So all of these are really truly helping us inform the design and the layouts of the school as we look at all of these considerations. So I'm gonna turn it over to Janet and she'll talk about the sites. 
Good evening. Um, my name is Janet Bernardo. I'm a professional civil engineer with the Horsley Witten Group, and uh, our role is stormwater, site layout, grading, and um, kind of supporting the wetlands permitting as needed. The Fort River site is um, 31 and a half acres located south of Main Street and access from Southeast Street. Fort River is on the east side of the property, the blue line on your screen. And there's a twin 44 by 27 inch arch culvert, the light blue line on the um, west side of the existing school. And that discharges to a brook located along the south property boundary, which eventually ties back to Fort River. There is a flood prone uh, conservancy. Yep, the, the flood prone conservancy zone district is the yellow shaded area here. And it covers a portion of the east side of the property and it's related to, but it's not contiguous with the 100 year floodplain. The Amherst zoning bylaws allows for educational use to apply for a special permit to build within this flood prone conservancy district if so desired. So uh, there is potential for uh, locating the school if, if that is the best use of the property within that area. Um, there's a FEMA is the, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, um, provided a 1983 flood insurance rate map, uh, which shows this light, kind of light blue bubble that um, illustrates the 100 year floodplain. And the darker blue kind of semicircle is the 500 year floodplain. In, um, 19, in 2021, FEMA has revised that 100 year floodplain line um, to be closer to the 171 foot contour, which is similar to the black dashed line on the screen. So the flood, the FEMA 100 year floodplain line will be um, pushed back and the town is supposedly going to adopt this new floodplain line sometime um, later this year. There are a number of wetlands around the property um, associated with um, Fort River and the 200 foot riverfront area that is associated with Fort River and the brook that's on the south side. The southernmost finger, the little wetland at the bottom there, kind of comes between the athletic fields. It's maybe, you, you might not realize that it's a wetland when you're out there. It's kind of a, a depression in, in the grass. And that is approximately 3,500 square feet, that little finger. And according to the Wellness Protection Act, a project is allowed to fill up to 5,000 square feet under the local permitting process. So it would mean um, working with and going to a permitting process with the Conservation Commission if, um, if it was decided to fill that finger. Um, the likelihood is we wouldn't be looking to fill any other wetlands. And, and at the same time, we're, the local permitting only allows 5,000 square feet. Um, so considering the various constraints on the building area there, the buildable area for the Fort River site is about 12.8 acres, the red, the, what's in that red area. Um, through some permitting, we could expand that to about 14.6 acres by pulling back some of the wetlands and the, the, the uh, floodplain line, as well as the flood um, prone conservancy area. And there's 19.8 acres of usable land, which would be, um, could be used for the playing fields as well. So it changes quite a bit. We did some initial soil testing. We understand that the groundwater is very high and that the soils um, of the site really do not infiltrate very well. So this is not a structural issue, but it is something that we would need to manage from, um, from the building as well as from the stormwater. So we would consider raising the surface grade of the building and the parking lots. We would consider raising the playing fields and adding sub drainage to um, allow the fields to, to be drier. 
Um, we would divert the stormwater and the groundwater away from the buildings by um, putting in uh, foundation drains and we would utilize constructed wetlands and bioswales for stormwater management. The idea of having um, small bio retention areas similar to these photographs, basically coming off of the parking lot into bioswales, having um, kind of integrating them in the play areas and they would eventually kind of small areas would be connected together to provide water quality treatment and bringing that all of the stormwater back down to the brook and Fort River. So um, if this could be used as an educational opportunity as well for the students of the school. I believe um, Mike Talbot is going to talk about the soils. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Mike Talbot. I'm the geotechnical engineering engineer on the team. And um, Fort River School is characterized by uh, um, river us. Uh, Recent deposits by the uh, for the fort from the uh, Fort River over soft far of silt and clay, which are glacial lake deposits. It's a profile that's pretty common in the Connecticut River Valley. Uh, we see this type of soil profile a lot. Uh, the soils are soft, so um, you have some issues with bearing capacity, building settlement. As uh, Janet had said, the soils are poorly draining and we have a high groundwater table. Um, all those, uh, those are issues that we see quite commonly in the valley. Um, we, can, we can address that a couple ways. We can, as I said, one way to address the bearing capacity and address the groundwater is to raise the building. Uh, with some amount of fill to get it out of the wet soils and, and get it into on good bearing material. That causes a settlement issue. We can do a couple things there. Um, we, uh, you can use rammed aggregate piers, which are basically stone columns. You can, uh, they can be in, uh, driven into the soil to reinforce and strengthen the soft soils. And you can also do what's called preloading. That's putting a soil load onto the uh, soft clays under the site, that's equal to the weight of the new building we'd be building and that basically pre-compresses the soil so you get less settlement uh, during the service life of the structure. Both of those things, is, uh, are, both of that is, uh, uh, we have done on many other sites in the Connecticut River Valley and they're, they're uh, pretty uh, common techniques to be used, so. Uh, this is this is a schematic uh, that uh, how you would treat the high groundwater. Uh, it's important to drain the water away from the building and to provide a capillary moisture uh, break. Um, I understand the the existing structure is damp and it's there's some moisture contents in it, uh, some moisture in the building, um, which is a concern and, and an issue. The way you would address that is these sketches show uh, a perimeter drain, which, which takes water and drains it away from the building. You would put underneath the slab a capillary break. So you, you are uh, separating the building from the, the groundwater table and you have an open gravel, which the water prevents the water from wicking up. And then you would do a, a moisture barrier. Uh, and it's my understanding at this point is uh, uh, it's believed that there's not a moisture barrier under the existing school and, and the existing school probably doesn't have a lot of these features. So, but uh, that's how we would address this two schematics. One here showing the renovation on the left and what it would look like in the new construction. They use a lot of the same technologies, but they are uh, uh, slightly different design. Um, Mike, if I could add, yeah. uh, it could the question could come up: uh, How do the foundation drains work when uh, the groundwater is high? And we are actually able to uh, daylight and and drain the area around the buildings to the south by gravity. 
which will help wick the water level down. And again, as Mike says, we're trying to control control moisture and keep moisture off of the contact of the slab and not controlling hydrostatic water. But these have both been uh, effective techniques in uh, reducing moisture transmission to building interiors. All right, Janet. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> back again. Um, the Wildwood site uh, is 14.3 acres and located south of Strong Street. And this site um, doesn't have the wetland issues that the Fort River site does, but it does have some steep slopes on the north and the east sides. So the buildable and usable area is about 10.5 acres, um, which would include the school and the playing fields with the idea of not um, not getting too in, into the steep slopes. The soils are very similar to the Fort Riverside, amazingly enough. Um, basically, this is more of a, of a bowl because the two sides are sloping down and the surface water runs down the, down the, the steep slopes. And so groundwater is only um, two to five feet below the surface. Again, the, the soil testing showed that the soils do not infiltrate very well. So we would manage it in a similar way by um, putting sub-drainage in the playing fields, diverting the stormwater away from the buildings, and proposing some bioretention areas and constructed wetlands through the parking lot and the playgrounds and the play fields to get it south, um, draining it all south towards Tan Brook. So it's similar, similar design. And Mike, I guess yep, you're back. Yeah, yeah I, I just want to correct Janet uh, slightly. The uh, soils are actually very different on the two sites, but the effect of those the soils conditions are basically the same. So you have the same sort of issues. Um, in the uh, at uh, Wildwood, the soils are highland soils, the glacial till, the hard pack that you see in the hills around the Amherst area. Uh, very poor draining, very, very hard soils, uh, a mixture of gravel, clay, silt, and the water will tend to pond and doesn't drain very well and, and you can tend to get shallow groundwater table. So that uh, it's basically the same effect as what Fort River, but Fort River is in a low lying area by the river, while this is in a more of an upland area where you have poor draining soils that keep the water, uh, that result in a high groundwater table. Uh, secondly, Fort River, uh, Wildwood, uh, the ball fields where we would likely be building the new school was actually filled ground when they built the existing school, we believe, where they, they cut into the hill and they moved fill into these playing fields. So you have non-engineered fill underneath the playing fields and underneath the area we would look at building the new school. Um, that this is common solutions to that. Uh, one of them, the most common one that actually Rick, I've done a couple jobs with Tanisco, with Rick specifically, where we've excavated the soil and recompacted it in place. So we basically dig up the site and recompact the soil so that are there to make a good engineered material that's dense and suitable for founding a new building on. An alternative which may or may be cheaper would all be using the same aggregate piers to densify the soils in place and stiffen the soils so you wouldn't have to dig it up. It's a matter of cost. During design, we would evaluate both alternatives and we would select the one that's most effective. They would, would both uh, result in a good engineering material, engineered material that you could found the building on. So. There, uh, as far as dealing with moisture and a renovation scenario here, I also like to add that where at Fort River, where there's a, a proven moisture issue that's been experienced over the years, uh, at Wildwood, uh, we would not need to go through the exercise of removing an existing floor slab to put capillary breaks and drainage pipes in. However, we do have the opportunity 
to have a on the surface applied vapor barrier because uh, vapor barriers under slabs are surprisingly a relatively new uh, building uh, component. And without, without any vapor barrier, there, that moisture transmission would ultimately get through the slab. So that's something that could be done to the uh, existing wildwood renovation. Uh, this is a site that uh, it's, it's applicable to, uh, we, uh, OTO did a project about 10 years ago at East Hampton High School, which is maybe 10 miles from Amherst as the, bird, as the crow flies. Very similar soil conditions to Fort River. As I said, Fort River is, is uh, the conditions are pretty common for the Connecticut River Valley. We have these low lying areas with the soft clays and the in the valley near the, near the river. Uh, you see it here. This is the school is in East Hampton. It's uh, the little green dot you can see over there, right there, is where the East Hampton High School, it's right near Rubber Thread Pond, you know, where they have the new walkway on the pond, the Guy City Hall in East Hampton, but very similar conditions. Uh, and uh, it had a swamp in the back. They built it it's exist near the existing high school. Um, they filled in the low lying area, added fill, and they had the soft clay and we addressed it with a combination of, as you can see, aggregate piers. We preloaded the soil, added the soil fill to, so that the, the new site had felt the weight of the existing school and the fill before we built the new school so that we controlled settlement of the school that way. And we can we raise the site so we control the groundwater and we have a nice dry school. It's it's performed for ten years without excessive settlement, um, and it's it's uh, operated uh, well. So and also we use aggregate piers. So schools when you design them have some engineering challenges by their nature with the loading. So East Hampton High School had that probably the Fort River School, but there are to you may, if you chose Fort River, you may see aggregate peers as part of the solution, so. Thank you. So I think um, we would like to just pause with our presentation and take any questions or comments that people may have as it relates to the sites. Feel free to raise your hand. I know we've received a lot of comments in writing, so we appreciate it. But if anyone has, well, we have our experts on the line here tonight. Wow. Okay. Uh, I sometimes I'm being told that no questions isn't a bad thing. That maybe maybe we address them. So we'll just keep going. Oh, Allison, sure. I can just yep. In the back of my mind, I remember there were times when some place they just filled in low-lying areas or swamps or whatever and found later that it was illegal and i'm wondering you know if, if you're if you're talking about anything like this uh and i i think that probably they were in that in the cases i'm thinking of maybe they they did fill something in but they had to build dig another pond someplace out or you know change it somewhere else to to um, accommodated. I don't know whether this has anything to do with that, but but when I, you talk about filling in spaces, that came to my mind. So if if you're referring to, uh, I'll just try to come back to, the, you're talking about the, I'm assuming the Fort River site. Um, and yes. yeah, and so if, if you're talking about um, the reconstructed wetlands down here, um, mm -hmm. what Janet had mentioned is that DEP allows us to mitigate these with up to 5,000 feet of um, area. We could fill it, but what we need to do is replicate it um, up at 10,000. So it's a two to one replication. Okay. So what we would do would be filling, if we, um, you know, took a little sliver of the finger here, what we would do is we would replicate it and take advantage of daylighting the culvert 
and we would mm -hmm. turn that into wetlands and we could also kind of connect the two wetlands from the east and and this finger here thank you you may have said something like that but it went through my head yeah. no 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 that, thank you for asking thank you for asking um, i meant sarah, to say something like that <laughs> yeah. uh, sarah marshall Thank you. Um, not this slide, I don't think, but a different one that showed the buildable area at Fort River. I just wanted to clarify, buildable including the fields or just literally where you could put a building? Yes, so usable um, is different than buildable, so thank you. So buildable is where we could construct the building which we're saying currently is 12.8 acres without any of the reduction in the flood prone conservancy wetlands or the modified flood zone area. Um, the buildable would increase to 14.6 approximately if, if we chose to address some of those issues. The usable is 19.8. In, in both situations where we could put field, we can replace the current existing fields that are there. All right. So we'll just jump into traffic and we'll ask Tim. Oh, Kathy. Um, I just wanted to add to that um, because actually Rudy Perkins brought up our, our code on the floodplain conservancy. We have to go, if we move into that area at all with the building, we have to go through a site plan review, potentially special permit. But for if it's green and grassland, we can use it, you know, so it, it's it's an issue of covering it up versus not covering it up, but we would have to go through uh, both the planning board, potentially the zoning board and the conservation okay. commission would get be involved with because it has to do with the water, the water and the wetlands and protected species. So there's it's not that it's not doable. It's just someone would have to um, bless it. Uh, yeah. Is, and is a, and all of that, even 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 with the potential reconstructed wetlands, we would have to go through the entire permitting review. And so, you know, for us, and, and you'll see all of our concepts that we've laid out are respectful of the current um, constraints of the site and the current lines, just just to be sure it can be done. And, you know, because it, it is an ask. It, it's not a given for sure. So we, and you know, some of those are there for a reason. So we, we just wanna be mindful of that. Uh, Christine Lindstrom. Yeah, hi, I appreciate you making the distinction between usable and buildable. Um, it's been helpful with the Fort River site. Are you able to do the same for the Wildwood site? Because the, I guess I um, more specifically, um, was curious about the sloping and does that make it, you know, is it because of a grade that it's therefore unusable or unbuilt the sloping areas of the site? Um, does that make it unusable or unbuildable or is it just that, you know, there are other expenses that accompany that? I, I just wanted a little bit more information there. Yeah, um, so for the Wildwood, what, what we're saying is the total site is 14.3 acres and, the usable and buildable combined because we don't have wetlands or other restrictions. Uh, we're saying our is approximately 10.5 acres is because we're recommending um, not building into the hill too much just because of the slope. We would be, we are talking about, you know, it, it might be beneficial for the project to build partially into the hill, but you really start incrementally having quite a bit of a cost if, if we build much further into the hill. And the other portion is the uh, driveway to the childhood oh, center. Oh, thank you. This, um, the childhood center we're, we're using, like our, we, we have to remain, keep that um, accessible at all times.
and we can come back. So if, if you think of other questions, feel free, we can always come back. So I will um, turn it over to, oh, going ahead of myself, sorry, no peeking, um, to Tim. Thank you, Donna, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, again, my name is Tim Thompson. I'm a uh, traffic engineer with PAR Corporation. And tonight I'm gonna share with you um, an overview of the results of our recently completed traffic study. Um, so before I get into some of the details, I just wanna you know, explain what the goal of our traffic study um, was at this point. And, and really what our traffic study is looking at is the, the impacts um, to adjacent roadways and intersections associated with the traffic generated um, by increasing the number of students at, at both of these sites. Um, so our first step in our traffic study was conducting an uh, existing conditions assessment. And I'll just quickly uh, describe the existing conditions on each of the sites. Um, what's shown in this diagram here is the Fort River um, site. And what you can see here in blue is a circulation pattern for uh, parent drop off and pickups, and then in yellow, uh, a bus drop off and pickup circulation pattern. So this site has two, uh, two separate locations, uh, bus and parent operations are separate. And also I should note that at the parent drop off locations, there are actually two locations where pickup and drop off occurs. So this actually it, it works quite well um, currently, and that's uh, in part due to the separation of bus and parent traffic, but also due to the, the staff that's on site that uh, helps control uh, uh, parent movements, uh, both entering and exiting the parking lot. Um, next slide, Donna. Then at Wildwood, it's actually a fairly similar um, operation here where, where bus traffic and parent traffic is separated on the site. And again, there are actually two locations within the, the parent drop-off area where pickup and drop-off occurs. So it's actually separated by, by grade, um, which allows some of the younger children to operate independently from some of the older students. Um, again, this operation operates fairly well uh, currently. Um, and again, there's a lot of staff on site that helps control these movements. Um, in both the, the morning and afternoon dismissal periods. So when we start to look at uh, evaluating the traffic impacts associated with each of the sites, um, we're, we're projecting our, our future scenario out into the future. So we actually, we look seven years into the future. Um, and what you can see here is a list of other projects occurring uh, within the town of Amherst um, that were considered uh, the, the traffic generation from these sites were considered in the projection of our, our future uh, scenario development. Next slide. Uh, and then you can see here, we have a rather large study area and each of our study intersections is denoted with one of those red dots. Um, so you can see here that we have the, the Wildwood site shown in the north part of our figure uh, and then the Fort River site down in the bottom right corner. And the number of study intersections that were uh, were looked at as as part of this study, and it's really you know encompassed by <clears throat> uh, Pleasant Street to the to the west, East Street to the to the east, uh, Strong Street to the north, and College Street to the south. So we we selected these intersections uh, to really try to capture um, how traffic would be redistributed if um, elementary students were were located at you know concentrated at one of these schools as opposed to, to both. So when we look at our traffic study, really the, the nuts and bolts of it is what we call a capacity analysis. And when we're doing a capacity analysis, we're, we're looking at each of those individual intersections within our study area and determining uh, how traffic operations, um, how, it, it, how efficiently it operates um, at, at each of those intersections. And we use what's called level of service to, to help us um, as a quality measurement for assessing uh, operations at each intersection. So level of service is, is actually determined by the amount of delay that a vehicle experiences as they traverse the intersection. So this is, uh, it's, it's quantified separately for signalized intersections versus unsignalized intersections. And level of service or LOS, as you can see in the column on the left, is broken up into a 
uh, a system ranging from A through F and the amount of delay for each of those ratings um, is, is shown um, in both of the, the columns to the right. Tim, I just would like to um, point that this is the seconds, the time that, that you wait at, yes. at each intersection. Thank you, Donna. So for an intersection that would be operating at level of service A, you're experiencing less than 10 seconds per vehicle on average. Um, while you maneuver through that intersection. So the next few slides um, show some tables that were included in our traffic report. And um, we don't mean to overwhelm you with the amount of information shown on this, these slides, but I'd just like to highlight the level of detail that this traffic study gets into. So um, for each intersection within our study area, we're actually looking at um, a level of service and delay associated with each movement at each intersection. So you, in the, sec the column second over from the left, you can see, you know, for example, the northbound movement, we're looking at the left movement and through and right movement and the approach total um, all separately. So it's, it's a rather in-depth assessment of traffic conditions that we're looking at throughout this uh, entire study area. And uh, over the next couple of slides, I just want to um, highlight a, a couple of figures within each of these uh, each of these tables, um, and what the tables that are shown in these next few slides really highlight uh, the intersections that are of greatest concern for us based on the results of the assessment. Um, so this first table here is showing the intersection of of Main Street, North East Street, and Southeast Street, and this intersection is just north of the Fort River. Uh, sites, the signalized intersection there. And I just want to point to some of the, uh, the Fs that you see across the, the top line for the northbound movement. Um, so you can see that the, the worst condition here is the scenario where uh, the school is constructed at the Fort River site, um, which is, of course, to be expected, um, and where you know, we're seeing a, a level service of F there. Um, with the school being constructed there, just given the amount of traffic that's associated with the additional students there, um, you know, we, we see a, a level of service F. So this is an area that we really wanna focus any potential improvements on. Next slide. Um, and this, uh, this table again shows the same results from the same intersection. Uh, this is particularly during the school dismissal period. Um, you can see in that, that same approach northbound, uh, we aren't showing F, we're showing more C's and D's. Generally, when school's dismissed, it's not, it doesn't coincide with a uh, peak hour of commuter traffic, which the morning does. So typically when we look at schools, uh, we see that worst condition in the morning when commuter traffic and school traffic are overlapping. Uh, again, closer to the Fort River site, uh, Southeast, Southeast Street at College Street. Um, you, know, you, you can see a couple of Ds and Fs uh, towards the, uh, the columns over on the right. Um, but really, if you compare those to the conditions that are in the center there, the, what we call the future no build, which is our future projection without any uh, school at the Fort River site, there, there's only a slight increase in, um, in delay per vehicle. Um, again, this shows the, the school dismissal hour. Um, the previous one had shown the, the morning uh, peak hour. Again, you can see a, a series of uh, Ds and Es at this approach. Again, not too much of an increase compared to the no build scenario. Um, this table here, we're specifically looking at the, the Fort River entrance, which is the driveway located on the south side of the site. Um, under our future conditions assessment with the school being constructed at Fort River, um, we, we know that the existing exit up towards Main Street um, can experience some challenges with exiting the site due to the, the queue that develops at the adjacent signal. So in our build scenario for the, the Fort River site, we actually moved all left-hand turn movements from the site to the south driveway. So what you see here is uh, under the condition where uh, for the Fort River site is used, um, you can see that westbound turn, which would be the turn exiting the site, 
we have a level of service F for that exiting movement. Uh, again, looking at the school dismissal um, peak hour at the same intersection, that westbound left turn from the site is no longer um, an F, but, a, but an E during this condition where there's generally less traffic on the adjacent roadways. Um, again, this is a, uh, th this shows the, the intersection of East Street with um, the Fort River exit. Um, you can see here that with the, uh, with the addition of the, the school at the site, we're seeing a uh, level of service of A's and B's. So this intersection at the entrance is not um, of major concern for, for us. So I had, I had mentioned that the, uh, the intersection of Main Street and Southeast Street, uh, we were experiencing a, a level of service F during the, uh, the AM peak hour. And we've come up with uh, one alternative to help mitigate that, uh, that traffic concern. So this, the conceptual plan that's shown on the right here includes the widening of the northbound approach to the intersection uh, to really lengthen that left turn lane to help us get more um, more space for vehicles to stack that are making that northbound left turn movement. Um, and then we're also looking at uh, replacing the traffic signal equipment at that intersection. Um, specifically, we'd be looking at modifying some of the signal phasing at that intersection to, to better accommodate the potential for increase in tra increased traffic there. Um, so this table here shows a comparison of the condition at Fort at that uh, signalized intersection adjacent to Fort River with no mitigation, and then with the uh, intersection improvements as shown on the previous slide. So you can see that a number of those Fs for the northbound approach um, are bettered to uh, to E's and D's. Uh, moving towards the a couple of the intersections towards the Wildwood site and focusing more on the um, the Wildwood alternative in and of itself, uh, a couple of intersections that stood out in our analysis um, are presented in the next several slides. First one here being the intersection at East Pleasant Street at Strong Street, which is the stop controlled intersection just to the west of the existing Wildwood driveway. Um, what you can see here is with the construction of the uh, the school at the Wildwood site. Um, in the morning, we're looking at a level of service D for that westbound movement, which is the stop controlled movement um, during the morning, and then a level of service F um, in the afternoon. So in the afternoon, when you have more vehicles that are leaving the school site, uh, approaching that stop controlled intersection, we're expecting to see more delay there. And then we looked at improvement or um, we look specifically at the, the Wildwood driveway and the intersection with Strong Street. Um, and you can see with the, uh, during the, the morning peak hour, we're looking at a level of service of C. Um, and then the school dismissal, we're looking at a level of service uh, B. So a mitigation option that we're investigating at the, uh, the entrance to the Wildwood site um, is the revision of that existing stop controlled intersection into a roundabout. Um, so this is under um, you know, preliminary design. Uh, we're just looking at it at a conceptual level right now. Uh, and then some other uh, mitigation alternatives that we're considering at the East Pleasant Street and Strong Street intersection um, include the potential for adding turn lanes at that intersection, we're also looking to see if traffic volumes at that intersection would warrant signalization um, as we look in the future. So again, this just shows the potential for improvements uh, with the introduction of the roundabout at the, uh, at the Wildwood driveway. You can see all the way to the right that we'd be looking at a level of service A for all approaches as, to, as compared to um, the situation without the roundabout where in the morning we would have a level of service C for that movement exiting the site. So I will pause. This is 
relative, it's, it is new information. So, and it's a lot kind of comprehend and take in all at once, but happy to pause and ask any questions. Nancy. Uh, I must say I'm impressed with the level of detail of the traffic study, as well as all the rest of the work that you've done behind the scenes on soils and everything else. My concern about the traffic is less about the cars and the delay, although that has to be handled, as it is about the pedestrian access uh, to those schools. And I'm wondering whether the Donesco study does anything, says anything about that, or whether there's something else you're looking at related to pedestrian access. I don't know. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, so uh, I'm glad you brought that up. And pedestrian safety and access to the site is cer certainly something that we're, we're considering, um, not only in the potential mitigation options that we're considering, but, but also with the connectivity into the site itself. So whether that be, um, wider sidewalks, buffer separated from traffic, uh, potential for bike lanes. Those are all items that we'll be considering as the design um, progresses. Um, specifically with the mitigation option of the roundabout at the Wildwood site, um, one benefit of roundabouts is not only to, to help uh, accommodate uh, traffic movements, but it also helps as a, as a traffic calming element in reducing speeds. So to have uh, traffic device such as a roundabout in front of the school, uh, we see really as a, as a safety improvement as well in that it'll help reduce vehicle speeds um, directly in front of the school. So while this, while our, our study and the details I went through tonight uh, focused, it'll, focused a lot on, on vehicular traffic, um, again, as the design progresses, um, you know, pedestrians and bicycles will, will, and their access to the site and safety will certainly be uh, considered as well. And I, I would just like to add that um, we're working closely with DPW with Guilford and Jason, your town engineer as well. And everyone is so knowledgeable and helpful and it's um, a combined effort to, to improve the intersections in and around the schools. Uh, Christine Lindstrom. Yeah, I had an almost identical question to Nancy. Um, you know, having spent, I guess we're one of the five walkers at Wildwood. Um, and, you know, there are, there's lots of safety <laughs> issues, but then also we live right next to the UMass campus where there's a large construction project happening and traffic mitigation that's not working that well and students are getting hit. Um, so, uh, the concerns about pedestrians and, you know, cyclists, I think are real because, um, you know, it happens around here, A, um, and then B, uh, you know, there's very little accommodation for pedestrians and walkers already, which I think contributes to such a low number of folks, um, you know, being willing to let their kids uh, walk and roll to school. And so, you know, the fact that that, it doesn't seem like it's gonna be sort of directly addressed in this mitigation study, which I understand is just about the vehicles. But one example would be, how long does your fourth grader have to stand at an intersection that might be, you know, a little bit more clogged than normal because of construction happening or, again, mitigation issues. Um, those are critical elements for parents deciding to opt in or opt out of, um, you know, their kid walking and cycling, which I think we would all agree would ultimately be the best, not only for the, ter the, you know, the term during which the new school is getting built and we have to have mitigation strategies in place, but also longer term. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Marshall. Is it fair to say that um, the East Street, uh, Main Street intersection 
even aside from the Fort River School traffic is busier and therefore the impact of building the school there. I mean, I saw a lot of Fs in those tables that I didn't notice. Maybe I just didn't see them for the Wildwood site that, that East Pleasant just isn't as trafficked um, as East Street. So that's one question. A second is, are, will you be estimating or maybe DPW would be estimating the costs of these mitigation measures? And thirdly, are any of them covered by MSBA or those would all be on the town? Thank you. Well, Tim, why don't you go ahead and talk about the intersection? I'll get the money. <laughs> well, so I, I would say that in general, you know, traffic volumes, um, are, are heavier closer to the the Fort River site. Um, there's 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 no denying that, and certainly it's it's reflected in some of the uh, results of the capacity um, analysis for the intersections that are closer to to Fort River. Um, now that being said, you know we are we're looking at at mitigation alternatives at at, at both of these sites, um, and we're coming up with with concept level designs specifically so that these can be um, priced out as part of uh, the next phase of the, of the project. And, and Donna can probably give some more uh, details on the, on the potential for, for costs and how that's gonna be uh, addressed. Yeah, um, I, I see Mike's hands up. I'll just quickly answer this. So um, MSBA will not participate in um, these site costs if they are outside of the school um, of the kind of scope of work or the school pr um, property. Um, even if they were, MSBA only reimburses up to 8% for site costs based upon the cost of the building. So um, they, w either way, it would be borne 100% by the town. But what we're doing is we're obtaining, uh, including those costs uh, as a separate line item in the preferred schematic report cost estimates that we'll be um, receiving at the end of the month. So that everyone so has a full uh, purview of whether it's paid by the town or paid by the, the, the project. Mike? Yeah, I mean, I'm far from an expert in learning a lot from our traffic consultants, so thank you for that. But the question to walking, um, Wildwood historically has had a, a much larger population of students who walk to school. Some of that's just geographically with the neighborhoods that are set behind it. Um, and, uh, you know, for Fort River, it's a little tougher because it's surrounded by um, pretty major roads uh, for elementary students to walk on a little further away from uh, residential areas. Um, we are uh, getting back into safe routes to school. We had had a program going for a while and that interrupted in COVID, uh, but we had an administrative leadership team meeting today on some of these topics. So I think uh, for all sorts of reasons, uh, our team, our leadership team is, is fully supportive of making whichever site it is, uh, you know, as walkable as possible. Uh, but I think it is worth noting that there are some distinctions geographically with proximity to residential housing and uh, distance from uh, the need to cross major roads that uh, play into how many walkers uh, would have access to safely walking to school. Um, so that, that was all I wanted to add. Thank you. And we know it's a lot to digest and um, we'll, we'll, Kathy, I'm not sure if the draft report has been circulated yet. Uh if for anyone who wants to see it, the draft report, um, I, I'll, it's, if you go on the Amherst Mass, msma.gov site for the elementary school building project, it's posted in tomorrow's packet. So it's still labeled draft because some of this, how might we mitigate it, but it's there in all its glory. Mm -hmm. And hot off the press, I might say it's yeah. not. It's not fully edited yet. It just it, it, this was a, a, a time dependent. We we needed to get it in this week. So yeah. Yeah. and and you'll see all the turning movements. All all you know um, that support these tables that we've done. Mike, do you still have your hand up, or was that just left over? Um, I think it's left over. It's left over. All right. You know, 
You know, I just, one thing I want to add in response to Sarah's question about costs is uh, Chris Brestrup was on a phone call that the state did on some grant programs that are opening up. Um, and one of them is called an intersection, a clogged intersection, and other is a safe walk. And so there are potentially, if you can show the need, it's not like we have the money in hand, but we're paying attention to it. And I specifically asked, could you apply if it's an exit or entrance to a school? And the answer was yes, um, on, on that, on that, these programs. Um, it's not that they'll pay for the whole thing, but there, it doesn't necessarily mean taxpayer dollar only, local taxpayer. That's, it's all of our taxes if it comes from the state. <laughs> so, yeah. Awesome. All right. And so now what we'll do is uh, just quickly get into the options uh, layouts that we've been talking about. And again, as everyone knows, the educational program is what um, uh, drives the design. Uh, we all know that the school committee approved the program back in March for 70,500 square feet for program area with a 105,750 gross square foot. This is based on new construction. Renovation is slightly different, but these are the numbers we're working with. Um, we've talked about spatial relationships and adjacencies and a student-centered learning environment. And well, this really is what we, we put all the program together. And some of you may have seen something like this before. The purple shaded are the gen ed classrooms plus special ed programs that all need to be integrated with the general education um, program areas. We have a dotted red line that tries to sort of divide the community use so we know what spaces would belong at the front of the building and access only to the community where the academic spaces is where we would, um, our, our goal is to close those off when the school is used for community use. There are a couple of spaces that kind of cross the line. Um, the cafeteria is gonna have a stage. So in, in typical uh, educational speak, it's gonna be a cafetorium. I think that's an architectural word that we made up, but it's going to be an auditorium and cafeteria together. And with that, we were you know, thinking maybe it would be nice to have the music close by. It can be utilized for the community. It can be a green, a kind of a green room to the stage. And the stage could also be used for the music program for overflow when, the, when, when needed if two music classes need to be taught at the same time. We also wanted to create a STEM or STEAM um, area for project-based learning. So we have a STEAM room associated with the art, the music. So you're gonna see a whole bunch of kind of interchanging associated um, relationships with all of the spaces. But what we have heard is that the gymnasium should be on the first floor and it should be accessible to the community as well as the cafetorium should as well be on the first floor and accessible to the community. So those relationships start building um, or, or shaping the building as we move forward. So we're, we're looking at either a two-story or three-story option for right this second, we'll just focus on a new school. And our goal was to make it as cost effective as possible, but it was also most important to make sure that the spatial relationships and adjacencies work for the school. So what we've done is, um, if you look at this diagram, we have, and you'll see it's pretty similar in all of them, is that we've grouped all of the community spaces together and they would be at the front of the building. This would be um, the entrance to the building coming, coming in on the right-hand side. There would be an administrative suite here that would be um, secure, and there would be a double vestibule that you would need to get buzzed in to enter the building. There's an elevator right at, uh, as you enter the building across from the gym and the cafeteria. So in this scheme, we would be able to close off the academic, all the purple, right at the end of the cafeteria. So it's a nice, safe, secured space, while it also allows community access to the front of the building. The building's organized with two grades per, per floor, 
and they're clustered in a way for collaborative learning. Kindergarten would be in one area, you know, uh, five classrooms plus some integrated special education programming would occur together. So there's a cross the hall collaboration for staff and students. And then another grade, assuming first grade would be located right next to it. So it really truly allows for vertical and horizontal collaboration among grades. And we'll have uh, very large light well stairwells that will bring in the natural light into the corridors and that it also helps with the circulation. Um, after designing schools for decades, we've learned that uh, vertical transitions in spaces is actually more efficient than uh, going walking uh, horizontally across in a, a, a very large corridor. So this actually provides the most time on learning as you go from floor to floor. The second floor would be organized in the same manner. We would have two grades clustered together, the media center, and then possibly a STEAM or a, or a STEM area with uh, STEAM room, art, music, and a nice collaborative project-based learning area here. And then on the third floor, it would have similar academic spaces, two grades with also some special education spaces integrated into the program. Tim? Um, now that we know the program of the building, which determines the size and the adjacencies, which helps determine the shape of the building, we can take that knowledge and test how the buildings fit on the site. Um, starting with Fort River on the left, we can compare that footprint to the buildable area of the site that we have identified um, and where it fits. Uh, we can compare it to the existing building footprint, which will be occupied and operational during construction of a new building. So once you take that out, your buildable area in the during construction actually gets a little bit less. Um, and then we can make sure that all of the other functions that have to happen on site, uh, outdoor learning, outdoor play, uh, the town uses for the recreational field, including parking and getting off the field on and off the site, um, all fit. Um, also shown at the lower left-hand corner of the site is the potential location for geothermal wells, which will be a part of uh, helping the building meet the town's net zero energy goals. So now that we know more about the building, we can test to make sure that as you enter and exit the site, we can orient the building in such a way that the entrances are where they want to be. Um, in this scheme, with this concept of building, it fits in an east-west direction, which allows the classroom windows to face north and south, which is optimal for uh, controlling glare and daylighting in the room. Um, you know, and this is just the first step of making sure that everything fits. If you notice on the Wildwood site, you are also with this concept able to get the same orientation of the building, which is ideal for lighting in the classroom. Um, You'll notice that we don't have quite as much room for an easily laid out geothermal field. It sort of has to snake around the existing building so that it can be operational on day one of the new building being in place. Um, but we are, there is enough room to fit all of the parking needs to build without going over the property lines and into the hill too much and creating play space to the north of the building that will be built once the existing building has been demolished and removed. So I just I would just like to add two things. Um, one is the geothermal well field and it, whether it's ground source or air source has not yet been determined. And so we'll be pricing both options for um, the next cost estimate. And there is a possibility and, and it, it's been a conversation that we might possibly be able to put the geothermal fields on the middle school site. There's an existing field down there that the middle school doesn't really use. So we would be able to possibly um, put the geothermal wells there covered up and then it could be an enhanced field for the community. All of these are still being studied.
So we started looking at different ways to break down the scale of the building. A small school feel was important. So we started looking at, well, gee, maybe what we can do is create you know, uh, pods, every pod per grade. And as you can see, you know, we would have kindergarten in one pod, the community um, use spaces and the, what we call core spaces would be utilized, would be laid out in the middle. And then we would have each, you know, grade have its own cluster per se. Uh, special education would still be integrated, but what we've learned in speaking with the special education folks, as well as just um, observations is that if you're a student in a special ed program and the ed program is say in the first grade wing, that that's a long way to go if you're a kindergartner. And so, you know, we, we just started looking at what are the benefits of each um, option or concept. And the only other thing to point out while this creates a nice intimate feel you lose a little bit of that vertical collaboration of older students in, um, engaging with the younger students. It's a little bit larger building, and so it does reduce a little bit of the site for outdoor learning and play. Uh, you can see as you fit this option on the Fort River site, the building has to be rotated a bit to fit within the boundaries that we've identified. So. Um, there may be some slight drawbacks in terms of lighting in the classrooms, which also is slightly less energy efficient, but it's a minor, less important concern than some of the other options on the site. There are also um, you know, differences in the vehicle circulation pattern, but they still work on the building. Um, if you notice on the Wildwood site with this option, you are a little bit deeper into the hill, which um, is something we would have to consider in terms of the cost, but the parking, the well field, if that is the option we work, those all still work with this concept on both sites. Tim, um, maybe just talk a little bit about a retaining wall, what will be required to build into a hill? So if we do build into the hill, there will be a retaining wall, depending on how far it could be up to 10 feet tall. Um, it, there are various ways of building the wall to make sure that the earth that is retained by the wall stays in place. And we also have to build drainage so that water coming down the hill is both diverted from the top and water that is collected in the soil behind drains in a way that doesn't undermine. Um, depending on the height, it could be, you know, a cost that we certainly is considerable. So um, we really want to make sure that we're using the site to the best of its ability before we go to that measure. And it's also a wooded slope with mature trees, that, which is an asset. So we want to make sure that we're evaluating all of the things. Look at Sorry, uh, I was saying we are just going to kind of glance over concept three. It's very similar to concept one. We were just trying to figure out how to bring additional natural light into the building. So then we uh, looked at a two story concept, um, you know, recognizing everyone is coming from a single story school and at Wildwood and at Fort River. So again, similar to one of the concepts for a three story school is we were trying to um, maintain a small school feel. So um, a, a two-story school would, you know, make this a very long linear building. So we were trying to break down the scale and reduce the travel time for students to travel to the core spaces, as well as for the um, special educational programs that should also be integrated. And very similar to concept two, nice um, pods that, that create these nice clusters per grade. You lose a little bit of the vertical collaboration between grades. And it, it is certainly a, a distance if you're a student in a special ed program that requires some services that might be in another pod. A two-story school as well um, is more expensive uh, than a three-story school, just given the nature of foundations, envelope, roof, et cetera.
Um, here we go. Oh, I went the it's, wrong way. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, with this two-story version has the largest footprint, so it takes up the most site area. So here you can see the largest difference between the two sites. We've actually changed the orient the configuration of the building with the same program on um, distributed among the two floors to fit on Fort River because the three pod version does not fit within the space between the uh, flood prone conservancy, the flood area, the floodplain and the existing building. Uh, that is not to say that if the building, if that building configuration were deemed to be the most advantageous for other reasons, we couldn't do what we talked about earlier in terms of getting uh, a permit to go into the flood program. But this just shows fitting within the buildable area. Um, and then there's also the possibility of taking the longer linear manifestation of this design and putting it on the Wildwood site, but then you get back into going a little bit deeper into the hill, which uh, for cost reasons, we probably want to avoid. But um, you know, as we work through these options, we will be testing all of the moving parts on the site to make sure that they continue to fit and that we are within the boundaries that we have uh, identified and the constraints on the site. So here's a renovation addition. We just wanted to point out, this is the existing building and the existing programs that occur, classrooms around the perimeter and the media center and support spaces are in the core that are not naturally lit. So one concept as we've tried to study is we tried to maximize the reuse of the existing building, but also recognize and bring, it's important to bring as much natural light as we possibly can into the building. So we would construct uh, what you can see, there's a red dotted line. We would construct an addition here first, um, and then we would come in, move the students into the addition, and then we would um, renovate this area and create a courtyard within the existing building to bring in as much natural light as possible. Um, the relationships, the, the way this is laid out, and you'll see the reasons why, because of how it sits on the site, is that we have the gymnasium actually over the cafeteria, which we do in, in many of our schools. Um, you're very fortunate to have these uh, available sites with the amount of acreage, but in many instances, the gym always goes on top of the cafeteria. And in this instance, given the limitations of the existing building on, on the site, that this seemed to make the most sense uh, as far as a renovation and addition is concerned. Other con considerations are, you know, we are able to group um, grades, five classrooms per grade, plus some special education pro um, programs uh, that would be integrated. And I think um, the only other things to point out is that it is a renovation addition so it is gonna be phased construction, which means there would be a longer construction time. Our goal to have a new school completed by September of 26. And this would actually take longer and we're estimating for this to be completed in 2027. Um, and given the complexities of a phased occupied building, um, we're recommending that we do a CM at risk delivery method, which does add uh, five, at least 5% 5 more cost to the project than if we did a hard bid chapter 149. And Tim will show you what we're talking about on the site once he's unmuted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. So yeah, there you can see the uh, renovation addition options on both sites. Um, they fit within the buildable area on Fort River. Um, the major difference that you can see is that the, when you're partially occupying the existing building footprint, um, there is more space uh, available for a better location of the geothermal well field if we in fact go that route. Um, there's also opportunity for different traffic patterns on site that um, separate um, different parking areas and car and bus circulation, which we accomplished with the other options. This just gives you a bit more breathing room. Um, but there are certainly challenges with this in terms of making sure that there's area around the site for construction and stuff like that. 
um, consideration for the building in terms of meeting the net zero goal? I'm sorry, uh, I, 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 I should have paused. I'm sorry, sorry, Tim. Um, no, no, I no, want to no. ask if anyone has any comments or questions as we look at the current concepts that are being considered. It is a good time to stop. Sarah. Can you hear me? Okay. okay. Yep, there All you right. Go. Two questions. If I, maybe I misheard in the ad reno, you said the gym would be over the cafeteria. Then what happens to the old gym space, which is still there, I think? Yes, yes. We would be converting the old gym into the media center for two reasons. One is the new gym is actually larger, slightly larger than the existing gym. And in order, if we wanted to expand the existing gym to meet the current requirements, it would be pretty tight as it sits up against um, the property line, number one. And it also would be much more expensive because it's a, uh, it, the structure of the building would require a significant amount of work. The other thing that we were considering is keeping the core program spaces for community use together and so that we would be able to, in some way, um, close off the academic wing um, to community access. All right, thank you. And if, I could, if you could go back to any of the three-story new construction designs. If, um, oh, pass there. Yeah. So I'm looking at Wildwood and it looks like the new parking can't be built until the old building is taken down. Does that mean that once the new building is built, the children have to get off the buses in front of the existing, the current school and then walk around a, the old building while it's being torn down to get to the new school? It looks like the Fort River parking is not much it's, changed. It's a little bit, but not much. So, so with any of these, when you have a phase, when you have an occupied site, so um, yes, we would be um, building the new school. We would be moving the students into the new school. We would have to create temporary drop off and pick up while the existing building is demolished and the site is complete. And this is uh, common. Uh, we do this all the time. Um, you know, it's temporary, but we would set this up so that when the students move into the new building, that there would be a drop off and pick up for them. And, and then we add, would, yep. Might add, Donna, that often in this scenario, uh, when you're trying to get a new school ready for September, you exit the old building in June as soon as school closes and you take advantage of that summer to get the existing building down. So while there's still construction going on, the actual building demolition is not. And that's often achievable when you're shooting toward a September uh, occupancy of a new building. All right. Thank you, Sarah, for asking that. All right, Tim. Um, just talk a little bit about um, how we're going to meet the town's energy goals uh, with both or either a new building or a renovation in addition. And uh, you have to approach this problem from multiple facets. One, you have to make the building perform well, um, which includes, you know, making sure that the building is well insulated, well designed, well built. Um, it helps to have a lower ratio of windows to solid wall, which insulate better. Um, we have to make sure that the systems are efficient, both the mechanical systems, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and lighting. Um, and then we also have to make sure that once we have designed a building that performs well and uses 
less energy than a typical building. We have to generate energy on site to get uh, on site. And so that's going to be in the form of uh, photovoltaic panels on the roof and on the site. Um, to make sure that we are meeting the targets, uh, we do a life cycle cost analysis that uh, determines how much energy the building will use and then, and then in turn the cost. Um, and then these are the assumptions that are the design at this point that we are using to, which are typical for our buildings, for buildings in the school market in Massachusetts. Um, this shows the energy use for the four options that uh, we are considering, uh, renovation addition and new construction with uh, air sourced heat pumps or ground source heat pumps. Uh, um, you'll see that the two ground source heat pumps perform a little bit better. Well, they perform better than the air source heat pumps. Um, there are some differences between renovation addition and new construction, but that difference is not as pronounced as the difference between the different systems, which simply are more efficient. And if we go the ground source route. So this slide shows the potential utility savings for the new building compared to the two operational elementary schools now. Um, the Fort River School heats with gas and there's also electricity for lighting and cooling. Um, Wildwood heats with oil and then there's electricity. Um, the new school would be fossil fuel free other than an emergency generator. So the natural gas and oil costs would essentially go away and the electricity costs would be offset as well as being more efficient would be offset by the power generated on site uh, with the photovoltaic. So what the town is currently spending now, well over $200,000 per year for utility costs would be greatly reduced um, and would represent a considerable operating cost going forward on the range of $200,000 per year. And then this is, um, a fairly detailed breakdown of the capital costs that would re be required for each system. Um, there are some large components to the system. Um, geothermal wells, if they are part of the system, uh, are a significant cost, uh, 2.8 million about for these options. Um, and then if you do not have geothermal wells for the options, uh, the building is going to use a bit more electricity because the air source heat pumps are a little less efficient. And so therefore you would be buying more solar panels to offset uh, the higher electricity use. Um, so uh, the total capital cost is the lower line of the chart on the left, which is the big difference between the options. Um, but then the operating costs over the 50 year expected life of the building is shown at the lower level of the chart on the right. And, you know, the difference is minor. Uh, so both of these systems and all of the buildings that are on the table will produce um, similarly efficient, um, well-performing buildings for the Amherst for the next 50 years. Kathy. Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing, and, you know, Tim, I know I've asked you, but we haven't seen it yet. If we weren't building all electric, but we had to have an HVAC system that was more traditional. I looked at the earlier Wildwood project and it, the HVAC was listed at about almost $5 million. You, you're going to be able to give us those numbers, right? So it's not like that first line becomes zero. We, no. we, have, to, we have to have a heating and air conditioning. So when, when this gets further along, we'll have a comparable to what I would call, you know, an oil or gas heated. So I just wanted to say that. And then the other thing we more recently met with Eversource um, that, that this is very conservative on what, there may be potentially some other credits that we get where Tim showed some costs to running our utility system. So that's still being explored um, on that instead of the, there was still a $9,000. So I just wanted to make those two because Eversource is getting, um, is increasing the level of support for moving away from fossil fuels. Um, 
I was just going to say, and we don't, we just don't have those numbers yet. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you're absolutely correct, Kathy. I mean, the, these numbers show the difference between the systems that we are considering to meet your um, fossil free goals. Um, if you absolutely could do a system that was burning gas or oil and it would be significantly, it, it's not free. There's, there's no question. There's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of money, but, uh, um, and we are conservative in our estimates just because as part of your bylaw, there is monitoring and commissioning that ensures that you meet your net zero goal. So, you know, we have to make sure that we give you a design that does in fact meet those goals. So I think we'll pause here and see if anyone has any questions. But I think Kathy, your point is very well taken that your capital investment, uh, regardless of um, it being a um, non-fossil or, or if we utilize fossil would, would run somewhere around these numbers. So that number, would have to be factored in. So really the question is what, what might be the delta as it relates to achieving your bylaws, which would be your um, pretty much your PV investment as well as the geothermal. So your capital costs up top, Rick or Tim can chime in, but you could say that it's going to be somewhere between 5.7 and 6.4. And it really is the uh, geothermal wells plus the PVs that are, are the added costs to achieving your net zero bylaw. That, that is basically accurate. It might even be a little bit higher because there is some equipment that would be required with the fossil fuel burning systems at the top line that aren't included here. So, uh, but in general, it's comparable. Yes. We'll make sure we break that out. Tony, I go for it. I don't know how to raise your hand either. I, I think it might be in the apps or something. Does Tony, Tony, do you want to unmute? It's not letting you unmute. Uh huh. Let me see if I can unmute you. Oh, can you hear you me go. now? Yep, there you are. Thank you. This is Tony Cunningham. Um, yeah, I just saw recently that UMass um, announced that they were going at carbon zero by 2032. And then this week, Smith College made a similar announcement. Um, and it seems like both universities are focusing primarily on geothermal to get them there. Uh, they both, in fact, I think the Smith College plan has geothermal in its name. Just wondering if you could comment a little on um, this move. It seems like if you want to really meet ambitious climate goals, geothermal, it would indicate is the way to go. Um, just to get some thoughts from you on that as far as the school goes. Thank you. Um, geothermal versus an air source heat pump is more efficient. Ground, ground source. Ground source, <laughs> ground source, heat, ground source water to water heat pump is more efficient than an air source heat pump as your heat sink for the building, and it will end up using less electricity. Um, it would be less of a concern if all of the electricity that you were using was generated on site with the uh, photovoltaics that are going to be uh, part of this investment, but not all of the electricity will come from that. Some of it will come from the grid. And for the foreseeable future, uh, the grid comes with a carbon uh, price tag. Uh, not all of the electricity that's coming through the grid is generated by renewable resources. So uh, it's a two-part answer. You'll be using less energy on site and the energy that you are not generating on site will be cleaner. Uh, so that is a lot of why geothermal ground source heat pumps will get you to the goal in a more efficient, faster way. I think, I think um, just to add to that, it is a, a little larger upfront cost. Um, and if you have the space for them, you can see over the uh, life of the building, uh, the overall cost is somewhat neutral, but it, the, 
upfront cost is more, but the maintenance of it is less. And we don't know for sure why UMass and Smith may be, but those are some of the thoughts behind why, why a lot of um, it, it, the, the industry is shifting to ground source. But we can certainly look into it a little bit more and, and try to understand what the thinking is behind that. Um, Sarah? So the total life cycle costs over 50 years are remarkably similar. Um, and as you said, we can you know, have the choice between saving $3 million or so upfront, um, but then paying, <laughs> paying it later um, as parts are replaced. Um, but my question is about the, the total replace the, the replacements of the HVAC and the PV. Are those likely to happen like all at once? Or is this replacing some parts like every year over 20 year? Or, 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 or would the taxpayer basically be hit some year? With a ten thousand dollar bill for a ten million dollar bill for replacing an HVAC system. Thanks. Uh, so these estimates are based on um, the predicted lifetime of the equipment, which varies between the systems, um, and it varies between components of the systems. Um, the wells themselves uh, will last as long as the building, but the heat pumps that are transferring the heat from the water in the ground to the water in the building um, only has a 25 year expected life. And then the air source heat pumps, the components of that have a shorter lifespan. So all of that is to say that this is an aggregate estimate of the replacement costs. Um, and it, during and, the- and Sorry, but they're and replaced they're over time. But they're replaced they're over replaced time. Over time at, yeah. and, and there will be minor replacements of parts that fail. Everything is something that fails. Uh, but at some point during the life of the building, there will be major work that will be required if you are taking care of your systems. Yeah, I think I think you could maybe say as an example, a roof, right? The the roof, you know you know, the roof will last 20, 25 years. And while you might have to patch it a little bit here, a little bit there, you're gonna replace the entire roof for the most part, right? At, at the end of its useful life. And I think you'll see the bullets um, down at the bottom here, ground source, you know, there are portions of it that you would have to replace. And then, and then later the air source systems useful life is about 15 years. And again, uh, the first cycle replacement is about 50% and then 80% later. But PVs is really what we're at, kind of to answer your question is that we're saying the average useful life right now for PVs is somewhere around 25 years. So you would, in theory, be replacing it all at once. All right, if, if that helps. Um, Chris Riddle. Thank you. Um, two things. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the oil-based or natural gas-based HVAC system, system that we would do traditionally would also have bits and pieces of it that would fail over time. I and mean, it would also have to be replaced on the same kind of time frame. Mm -hmm. So it's, you shouldn't feel that the, uh, the replacement of the PV and the replacement of the ground source or air source heat pump systems are any different in that respect from oil-based or gas-based? That was my one question. And the other thing, Tim, did I um, hear you say that you thought we would, if we went to air source, we would be using more electricity than, I mean, we would, we would have to pay for more electricity than with, uh, with the ground source? It seems to me that we both of these have to be net zero systems, whether they're, yeah. so, that, so there shouldn't be any difference in the out-of-pocket expense any for every month that goes to Eversource. No, yeah, and to clarify, uh, if I was not clear, you are correct. The utility bill would be the same, uh, but the building would actually use more electricity and therefore the array of photovoltaics would have to be larger and that larger investment for the air source 
options is reflected in the chart on the next. So that's what the difference in the price for PV for the options is. So regardless of the system, it would be designed so that it balances to net zero. So you see the difference in the uh, cost for the PV, that is the reason why. Essentially you are spending the, depending on the option, 600 to 700,000 more to make sure that you are generating the energy so that your electricity bill is the same. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Uh, just one other comment. I'm learning, uh, just so everyone in the audience knows, I'm just, anything I say is because Dinesco people are, are teaching me. <laughs> but, but when you priced out the PV, you told us that part of that cost is the installation of what's holding the panels up. And, you know, part of these will be over the parking lots. Mm -hmm. um, because not all of it fits on the roof. So we're not talking about all of that cost in 25 years. We're talking just about the panels, correct? You know, I'm not trying to get you to say what part is what, but some of it is we've got, like when we look at UMass, it's got those canopies over the parking lots. It's the panels that not, not the whole structures. It's a quite, I should ask it as a question. Uh, you are correct. There are certainly elements of the system for the PV that will um, still be functional 25 years. It is the panels themselves that have to be replaced. Um, and then what this assumes is the current um, cost of the PV uh, projected into the future linearly assuming the price would be the same, but if you look at the actual cost of PV over the past 25 years, it's come down dramatically, you know, and if you were even to continue that trend at half the rate, um, this would be inaccurate, but this is another point of us being conservative because we don't know. Uh, so of all the predictions on here, that's maybe. It's, it's probably yeah. overstated and, yeah. and, and Kathy, you're correct. Um, it was just a little hard to yeah. uh, factor in the cost of the structure or, or we remove the cost of the structure. Uh, majority of the cost is in the panels, but thank you. So, um, here we are at the, uh, I see Margaret Wood, our OPM is on. Um, Margaret, I'm, I'm happy to keep going or if you wanna say a few words, there she is. Hi, Margaret. There we go. Sorry about that. It's having trouble unmuting. Yeah, I'm happy to say a few words about this um, very simplistic diagram of where we are. Um, I think as folks know who attended the prior meetings, um, we made a major submission in March, which is what's called the preliminary design program. And it's, uh, I think of it, I think the simplest way to think of it is it's kind of due diligence document that sort of provides all the background information that the MSBA is looking for as a funder and sort of sets the table for the um, phase that we're in now, which is called the preferred schematic, which results in a preferred schematic resort report, which at the moment we are committed to submitting that to the MSBA on June 27th, sorry, June 27th, yes, which is a hard deadline um, that is tied to their board approval of our preferred options. So the, the content that um, Denisco is presenting tonight is really sort of heading now directly towards uh, the building committee making a decision about what the preferred option is. So obviously, Denisco has done a huge amount of work sort of looking at different options. Perhaps the biggest piece of this, which will be coming in the month of May is the estimating. So, um, and just to say a little bit about the way this works, um, the uh, 
Danisco's team has a cost estimator and I have a cost estimator and they essentially estimate in parallel these options. And um, then we reconcile them and present them to the building committee. So there's a lot, I would say there's an awful lot of analysis that Danisco has presented in the last two meetings, which, you know, I think people can have their preferences about, you know, I think some different people will feel differently about the content they're seeing, but I think the estimating and, you know, finding the best value project for the project, which is coming very shortly, um, is going to be a major milestone. So there is a community forum on June 9th, as is outlined on the slide, um, at which the, S, the cost estimates will be presented. Um, Donna and Danisco team, I don't think at that meeting there is additional content in terms of your analysis that we'll be presenting. That's really what we'll be focusing on. And perhaps a summary of the analysis that the building committee is starting to do of how to reasonably compare these options to each other. Agreed. Yeah, no, we, we um, hopefully we're, I think, done for this phase until a preferred site is selected. Our investigative work is uh, complete at this point. Yeah. And again, then there's this gigantic document that goes into the MSBA and um, they have a board meeting about six weeks later. Um, in the meantime, I expect that the design team will begin to start doing what's called schematic design. Um, of the preferred option with a goal of sending that to the MSBA with a cost towards the end of this year. And then there would be a local vote on the community share of the project in, I would say the early spring, we haven't really set a date for it as well as the MSBA board vote on the project. So that's to give you a sense of next step. So we are coming up to you know, really major decision point, but the next six, five months after the June 27th submission, we'll see a huge level of additional development of the design of the preferred option. And there will be more meetings to sort of present that material to the community. Yeah, then it starts to become real. Right now, you're you're seeing sketches. Um, it's kind of hard yeah. to picture what this block, what this classroom looks like, right? So we we really are excited to move to the next level. So we um, are going to be busy for the month of May, um, and, and and I know many of you do join the building committee meetings. They are open um, to the public. And we will be finalizing the cost estimates and then reporting to the community on June 9th before we make any final vote of which preferred solution is, is the choice. Sarah. We've seen multiple three-story options and two-story options and add reno options. So which, which of those will go to the cost estimator. Uh, we will have, thank you. We will have um, a three-story option, two-story, and a renovation addition for both sites going to the cost estimators. The um, costs are, for the most part, at this level, uh, cost per square foot for the building it's the site cost that might slightly be modified given the geometry and what needs to be done to accommodate them. So we know that the square footage of the building truly shouldn't exceed, you know, uh, for a new school, uh, 1, 105,750 and uh, the renovation can be slightly more than that. But we'll have three cost options per site. Chris, right on. So, uh, will you, for those, those three designs on those two sites, um, the six different designs, will, we, will there be three-dimensional di three imagery of all, all six of those designs? Will we see the shape of these buildings? I, not, not, not at um, this level. We haven't uh, developed. There are 
we haven't even selected which, I guess, concept of layout is that we were, um, that we've presented, right? We have three different concepts. So at this point, we weren't um, intending to provide any three-dimensional drawings. There's, we don't have enough direction, I think, at this point. But there will be, um, just to be clear, there, the, much of what the estimators are using um, to estimate is what's called a basis of design narrative that describes what is anticipated for building envelope um, and uh, structure and building systems. So um, there's real, and, and I think that's really important because we want the assumptions, those assumptions to be comparable between each option. So although there's nothing drawn, uh, you know, in the sense of, you know, being able to select the option based on, well, I like the way that one looks. That's not the intent of this part of the process. The intent of this part of this process is to find the best kind of combined fit, what I call the best value option that meets the educational program and, and is the best sort of budget option for the community. And if, and, if I could add to that, the, base, the basis of design, you've seen a portion of that when Tim was talking about the net zero assumptions where the envelope is 23% windows, then we will go on to say of the remaining 77% uh, assume that X percent is brick, Y percent may be some other architectural accent. And these will get written into the basis of a design along with floor to floor heights so that volumes are established. And so while it's a square foot price, it's based on a bunch of elements that influence cost. Sorry, Kathy, go ahead. I, I was just gonna say, you know, and my understanding um, to respond to Chris is that once we've picked a site and whether we're building new or add reno, that's when we're gonna start to see as you design it, three-dimensional designs, what does is, what is the cafetorium look like? You know, is, or what's the color of the walls? Where are the windows? You know, so we're gonna get getting, starting to look at something that looks more like a building. Am I correct? Yeah. So right now what we're doing is we're presenting many different concepts and um, many different on, on both sides, right? Um, the next phase will be presenting many options or studies, but for one solution. And so that, that is when, you know, we'll have the time to three-dimensionally show everyone what one option looks like over another option and what one material might look like over another option. Yeah. Sarah. Will the cost estimate uh, estimate estimates also include the various site costs like raising the whole site at Fort River or dealing? So it's not just the building, the square footage. No, cost no. It, 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 right, it will be um, all, all of the site features that are necessary or required to um, make each concept viable, such as the retaining walls over at Wildwood or raising the building or um, you know, putting the additional uh, drainage system at Fort River. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. There's, so one thing I might just add for those who are on the line, but if you know people who haven't been, we're going to be posting the recording of this on this website and the charts 
Um, I think there were a couple changes in the charts since we posted them this morning, Donna, but we will post the charts both on the town website and also on this, um, on our amherstschool.project. So if you want to go back and look at the charts, um, if there are questions that occur to people, um, please, uh, you can email uh, Kathy, and it's my last name with a C and then Amherst at amherstmath.org. Gov, I'm the chair of the building committee, and I try to get any comments or questions. If it's just a direct question, just goes to the DONESCO team. If it's observations, comments, we're, we're, we're trying to share them with the committee. We are really welcome to hearing more because this was a lot of information in one sitting. And so I, think I think, yeah, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Um, I, I, we, I truly, we appreciate everyone's input. Um, I, I'm hoping that as we receive the comments that we respond in our presentations that we've heard, we've addressed. Um, and if we've not been able to address it, it's just because it might be not the right time. It might be a little premature in the process to be able to respond to some of your questions. but. Uh, I, I truly want to thank because there are several individuals that have shared and provided information to us that have been very helpful um, in our process. So I, I really want to thank everyone for your investment in this project. And I guess we'll see you on the 9th of June, if not before. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.